Latif, President of the Foreign Policy Association, and I want to welcome you to the fourth annual Spiros Voutsinas Memorial Lecture. I also want to wish you a very happy new year. Spiros was a highly respected member of the FPA Board of Directors. He was a great banker and an even greater humanist. We miss him very much. I want to thank New York Community Bank for underwriting this lecture series. We are especially grateful to its president and CEO, Joe Ficalora, who is our speaker this evening. Joe is a recipient of the Foreign Policy Association Medal, and he succeeds Spiros on the FPA board. To formally introduce Joe, we are going to turn to Nick Kaffis. Nick is a senior vice president and head of high yield corporate bond trading at TP ICAP. He also happens to be Spiros' son-in-law. Nick, the floor is yours. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening for the fourth annual Spiros Boutsinas Memorial Lecture, reflecting on the 2008 financial crisis with Mr. Joseph Ficalora. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nick Kafis. I serve on the advisory board of directors for Atlantic Bank, which is the vision of New York Community Bank Corp. I am also, as Mr. Latif said, Spiros Boutsinas' son-in-law. And on a personal note, I would like to thank you all on behalf of my wife, Christina, who's in the audience here tonight, and the entire Boutsinas family uh, for joining us. And I would like to thank Mr. Noah Latif and the Foreign Policy Association for helping to keep Spiro's memory alive in this annual lecture series. Spiro was a banker his entire life and was a very proud to be a member of this organization. He very much enjoyed discussing finance, trade, macroeconomics, and foreign policy, especially as it pertained to his native Greece. I'm certain that he would have enjoyed participating in this evening's discussion. It was Spiros who helped negotiate the acquisition of Atlantic Bank, which was formerly owned by the National Bank of Greece by New York Community Bank. Tonight, our keynote speaker, Mr. Joseph Ficalora, President and Chief Executive Officer of New York Community Bank, will walk us through his reflections and lessons learned from the 2008 financial crisis. New York Community Bank traces its history all the way back to 1859 to its original charter as Queens County Savings Bank. NYCB has grown through a series of acquisitions and today is the 24th largest bank holding company in the United States. The company has reported assets of over 50 billion, loans in excess of 40 billion, and deposits over 30 billion. The bank operates over 250 branches across several divisions and across several states. New York Community Bank Corp is a leading producer of multifamily loans for a portfolio here in New York City with an emphasis on non-luxury rent regulated buildings. I'm sure this evening Mr. Ficalora will touch on why this business model was so resilient during the 2008 financial crisis. NYCB is well regarded in the banking industry for its low efficiency ratio. For the non-bankers amongst you, that means low operating expenses and low loan losses and extremely high asset quality. In fact, New York Community Bank is one of only a handful of large financial institutions that actually refused federal TARP bailout money from the Federal Reserve during the financial crisis. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Mr. Joseph Ficalora. Under Mr. Ficalora's leadership, NYCB has evolved from a mutual savings bank with seven branches in Queens and Nassau County to the publicly traded multi-bank holding company, which it is today. NYCB stock has returned over 4,000% since its IPO in the mid-1990s, delivering substantial value to shareholders. In addition to his responsibilities at NYCB, Mr. Ficalora provides leadership to several professional banking organizations. He currently serves as director of the Federal Home Loan Bank of New York and was formerly its vice chairman. He is a member of the American Bankers Association Government Relations Council. He is chairman of the New York Bankers Association Metropolitan Division, and he's on the board of directors of Peter B. Cannell and Company, an investment advisory firm, amongst many others. Mr. Ficalora is also an active participant in community affairs. He has been a member of the Board of Directors of the Queen's Chamber of Commerce since 1990 and has previously served on its executive committee. He has also previously served as president of the Queen's Library Foundation and on the advisory council for the Queen's Museum of Art. 
He is on this board of the Foreign Pol Policy Association, and he's on the board of trustees of Pace University, as well as on their investment committee. Additionally, Mr. Ficolora is also a well-known philanthropist uh, in the local communities here in New York, and his personal foundation, the Ficolora Family Foundation, primarily supports educational and cultural initiatives. Lastly, it should be noticed, noted that Mr. Ficolora is also a global citizen, and in our ever-increasingly global world, Mr. Ficolora truly embodies the spirit and ideals of the Foreign Policy Association. That is, through his many interactions with business leaders and elected government officials, he develops an awareness and an informed opinion of U.S. foreign policy, economics, and global issues, and their impact on the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming Mr. Joseph Ficolora, CEO of New York Community Bank. Thank you. You've heard more about me than you need to. Uh, I'm certainly pleased to be here. Obviously, uh, I had the pleasure of working with Mr. Vucinas. Uh, he was on several boards, uh, banking boards uh, in particular, and, and he served on our board, and he was the president of Atlantic Bank by choice. He uh, did a fantastic job for us all, and uh, some of you may have worked with him during the time that he was, in fact, president of Atlantic Bank. So, having said that, the crisis of 2008 was not very dissimilar from those that had preceded it in similar fashion. The idea that, that there could be a cycle turn which would devalue assets of all types uh, is in fact not uncommon. It is something that happens every four, five, six, seven years. Typically, this cycle has been elongated to a period that is greater than any of its predecessors. So whether the adjustment is significant, such as the adjustment was during 2008, or lesser, the reality is that cycles are not merely economic phenomenon, but they're psychological phenomenon. And the single most important thing to recognize in cycle turn is that people come to a belief that the value of assets that they have control over will change adversely in some period in front of them. And as that evolves, more and more people decide to sell assets at ever lesser values. The cycle starts to get really difficult when those sales become extreme. In all meaningful cycles, they do become extreme, excepting it usually takes some reasonable amount of time for people to actually decide to sell those assets they have control over. Um, and there are all types of assets. It could be your home, it could be your stock, it could be anything that you have accumulated that has a value that is subject to somebody else buying it at what they perceive its value may be. Now, cycle change is extraordinary because the belief becomes the issue. The magnitude of change is driven by the willingness of people to take less than they purchased an asset for, less than an asset has recently been valued at, less than what anybody that they know would, would suggest that asset should be worth. But, and this is the important but, cycles occur on a regular basis. There's no escaping the fact that the prospective cycle, the one that's in front of us, has the potential of moving at a speed that is faster than its predecessors because of the interlock between the way values change between countries, between businesses. The idea that prospectively this pending cycle will move rapidly and to a greater degree because massive amounts of value can be changed very, very quickly. So when, when you think about it from the standpoint of, well, we've gotten through cycles in the past. The truth is some people go out of business during cycles. The truth is many people lose massive amounts of money. In some cases, they lose their home. 
Because think of it from the standpoint of if the value of your house is less than the loan you have on your house, you've lost your house. And, and there are many, many, many ways by which values go down. During cycle, there are very few things that actually are encouraging or bring values up until there's a firm belief that the values have hit bottom and then people start to think about getting back in before the turn. They don't want to be late to recovery. They want to get there soon enough so that they're actually capturing great value. Because in cycle turn, the very same asset could change in value, 60%, 80%, going down, and then go back up. So if you're, if you're at the right end of the cycle and you're acquiring assets, you're in a great place because you're acquiring assets at deep discount. If you are the owner of assets and you have not sold early in the cycle, you're going to sell at greatly discounted values. So that could be your equities. Equities change value very quickly, as we've seen recently. That could be your home. I mean, these are two typical assets that most people have some familiarity with. But there's also the change in value of many things that are institutional. There's also change in value from one nation to another nation. The idea that values could change dramatically, and we all know about the specificity of the change, is important to recognize. So when values change, let's just say in Germany, many people make decisions in France, or maybe in the US. When values change with regard to New York, many people make decisions with regard to London. And, and the reality that, that the availability of information and the consequence of change is going to be significantly greater today and in the cycle to come than it has ever been before. Now, arguably, people could say, well, everybody knew that things were happening and that values were changing. It's the magnitude of what they know and how rapidly the change occurs. The faster the change occurs, the greater the panic. And, and you say, well, you know, people aren't jumping out of windows. Well, very, very few, very, very few. But, but reality again, the idea that, that people can come to a conclusion that changes their willingness to hold an asset at value is extraordinarily obvious. It happens all the time. And in cycle, it happens at a magnitude that is meaningfully discernible, meaningfully going to have consequence to many people that are not players, they're not active you know, stock traders and they're not active in the real estate market making money, buying and selling homes. It's their home. It's where they live. When the value of their house is less than their mortgage, it becomes a problem. Now, there's no question that when we look to the period in front of us, there is going to be an interlock between many, many, many different nations, many, many different corporations, lots of people that have the ability to make a decision will make that decision. So, so for example, a broker may in fact structure a wonderful portfolio of assets that he believes can sustain themselves during a cycle turn, during a crisis. Well, that's wonderful, excepting when grandma gets a visit from her granddaughter, and the granddaughter says, that's my money, get my money. And she calls the broker and says, send me my money. It doesn't matter what he thinks. It doesn't matter what he owns. He has to go to cash. And when he goes to cash, he is participating in the process. So, so the decisions that are being made are not always made because there's been a conscious legitimate decision that the value of the asset that is being sold is an appropriate value, that the consequence of doing the trade is in fact appropriate. It occurs in many cases because there's no way not to have it occur. Sometimes people need to meet demand on, on let's just say, their loan on their home. 
So they, they give up the lease on their car or they give up some other benefit that they have some control over in order to accommodate that. When large numbers of people make the same adverse decision, the consequence in real dollars becomes extraordinary. The consequence to a nation becomes extraordinary. The interplay between countries, in fact, often means that when devaluation is occurring, it doesn't occur in just one place. It occurs in many places. There's much crossover with regard to the kinds of investments and the kinds of assets that people have access to. And sometimes corporations or companies are multinational. They're doing business in many different places. They own assets in many different places. So when the problem is moving, let's just say, rapidly in Germany, it could affect assets in France. When things are happening in New York, New York has extraordinary real estate. The values in New York are higher than most places in the world. But the values in New York have changed. During cycle turn, there is no question that the magnitude of change can literally put properties into foreclosure, could put whole communities into distress. And as the, the problem is multiplied by large numbers, the consequence becomes greater. And as the consequence becomes greater, people that were otherwise comfortable in holding the asset decide, this has gone too far. I'm not going to continue to lose money. And they lose a massive amount of money. Because once you make the decision, you don't get it back. Unless you get back in later. But often, the people that lose the money don't have the resource to get back in later. Obviously, there will be people that make money. On every adverse cycle, there are people on the other end of the cycle that make money. It'd be wonderful if you pick the right choices and you're on the other end of the cycle. But there are far fewer people who actually make money in cycle turn than the numbers of people that lose money in cycle turn. It can be quite consequential. So, many people will look back at 2008, 2009, 2010, and remember, it wasn't that bad. You know, I still live in the same house I lived in then. I didn't lose my house. I didn't lose my car. I didn't lose my job. Well, in every cycle, there are people affected and people that are not affected. And those that, that lose temporarily the value, let's just say, of their stock. You don't lose anything on your stock when the value goes down, unless you sell it when the value is down. And the issue with regard to cycle is the belief becomes so strong that people execute on the diminished value of their assets, whether it be their home or it be their stock. Sometimes they don't have choice. If the value of their asset has gone down sufficiently and they have a loan, well, the loan is called and they can't meet the requirements to pay the loan because the house isn't worth the loan. So what happens? They lose the house and then the house is sold at a deep discount. So I say that the cycle in front of us is worse than any cycle we've seen to date. I have no idea when it begins. It could begin as soon as this month. It could begin sometime during this year. It is inevitably going to begin sooner than later, and it's a belief, which means negative discussion, whether it be on television, in the newspaper, in, in informed write-ups, negative discussion can convince people that things are a mess, that things aren't going to get better, that we are likely to see some massive devaluation. When that occurs, they act. And when enough people act, they actually change the value of assets. So when assets become available in the marketplace at deep discount, there's no question that there are people losing money. And, and certainly, as that perpetuates itself, as that goes on for some period of time, there is going to be serious consequence 
to those that are, that are frightened by the events, as well as to those that are very, very comfortable doing what they're doing. As I mentioned, a broker who says, I have great assets. I have no reason to sell these assets. These assets can sustain themselves through the cycle. Has no choice. If the liquidity demands suggest in order to meet the requirements of his clients, he must sell, there is no choice. And in many different ways, people are put into the position where they have no choice. So having reserves of money, that's money. We've gone to a, an environment where there are an awful lot of people that think you shouldn't have cash. Well, that's, that's good, excepting if cash isn't available, it could very well be that that's the only thing that will meet the needs that you may have. Because sometimes it's conceivable that banks, for one reason or another, are not going to be in a position to provide cash. If the bank isn't open and the system isn't working, you're not going to get cash. So who wants to have money hanging around the house? Nobody. But who's going to eat if there's no money available from the bank? Or you say, well, how's that possible? How's that possible? Well, if, if banks make the decision that they're not going to make cash available, and that decision is made because they believe there's a serious crisis, then, in fact, you have to act. So I'm sure many of the people in the room remember that the government made a decision on a weekend. And that decision was made to give the Secretary of the Treasury $700 billion to accommodate a pending crisis. Now, the vast majority of people had no concept of what the crisis was. Very, very smart people told the President and the Congress that the solution being proposed by Paulson could not work. And yet, that weekend, Democrats, Republicans, and the President got together. And when they got together, they discussed the magnitude of the crisis and the need to provide the Secretary of the Treasury with something that had never in the history of this country been done. They agreed to give the Secretary of the Treasury $700 billion. There's actually a picture of Paulson on his knees in front of Pelosi. That weekend, contemplate, the Democrats, the Republicans, and the President all agreed that they would do something extraordinary. Give the Secretary of the Treasury $700 billion. And there were knowledgeable people that said the Secretary's plan could not work. Why do they do that? Why would they make that kind of a decision? Because there was evidence that the banks would in fact go to cash. The banks would not make money available on that Monday. The banks would hold everything that they had and deal with the legalese later. Possession. They were going to keep the money they had in their possession. Is it conceivable? Well, that actually happened. They gave the Secretary of the Treasury $700 billion. That was on Sunday. And by Thursday, the Secretary of the Treasury acknowledged that the plan that he put forth could not work and changed what he did. Now, the vast majority of people had no idea how bad that was. But what did they discuss? Well, they discussed that New York City would only have food for 27 days. They discussed that, that there wouldn't be gasoline for cars or trucks. You couldn't get deliveries. They discussed the magnitude of the problem because so much of the money we need is provided daily. So much of the funding of our lives is provided daily. And if there was a disruption in that funding, the only people who could actually buy anything were people that had money. Well, you could have a million dollars in the bank, but you don't have money. 
You can't go to the grocery with your bank account. You have to have dollars. Oh, the modern era. People carry cards. They don't carry dollars. Well, your card is worthless if the bank you're drawing against doesn't have the ability to let you take the money out of the bank with your card. The only thing you could buy food with is money, cash. Now, in this modern era, nobody talks about that. But it wasn't so long ago that this event actually occurred. The extreme, the reality, it actually happened. It actually happened. Everybody, not everybody, but most people are aware that Paulson did get $700 billion. And he did take some prudent steps to utilize that money to stabilize the situation. But how close were we to an adverse outcome? Well, think about who made the agreement. The Democrats, the leadership, the Republicans, the leadership, and the presidency, all in one place at one time, all agreed without there being headlines, without there being a lot of nonsense, they all agreed. And they did something that had never, ever been done before. And it passed without much discussion. The vast majority of people never had a clue that it even happened. So, cycle turn is inevitable. The cycle in front of us has good reason to move at a speed faster than any predecessor because of the interlock between so much of how we do our business. The reality is that money can in fact be withheld, that, that the reality that values can change rapidly is pretty obvious. The, the ability for systems to, to communicate worldwide, so consequent, so, so for example, things happen in New York, and let's just say bonds in Italy default. Things can happen throughout the world and have impact on other places in the world. The ability for these things to be tied together is not always a good thing. If in fact by tying things together you make it safer, that's wonderful. But there's no evidence that that's true. So, 2008, 2009, 2010, Consequential. Real value was lost. Some people lost all their savings or a substantial portion of their savings. So, so for example, real estate in Sands Point, the local community, relatively speaking, collapsed. Why? Because large numbers of people had lived there all their lives and they lost a sizable amount of their money as a result of a broker but they all happened to live in the same neighborhood. So they all had to sell their real estate at the same time. When you in fact dump anything into the marketplace simultaneously, you change values. So the values of all of the real estate in that community went down because an inordinate number of owners in that community lost the money that they were in fact utilizing to keep their house. So, so value change, cycle turn, inevitable. Value change, cycle turn, inevitable. And yet most people do not prepare for that. And the consequence of the change prospectively, you think, well, well the government's gonna put in place a program. Somebody's gonna take responsibility. Somebody's gonna do the right thing. Not necessarily so. In some cases, it's your own personal decision because these are your assets. In some cases, you make a decision that in fact you have some measure of control over and that decision may not be the greatest return that you can get, but it's the salvation of what you have. Keeping what you have may be far more important than what you can get. So, so when we talk cycle turn, the psychological events, even though there are economic reasons for the cycle to occur, they're psychological events because the real change in value comes from belief. 
and, and the belief that the value of your asset, whether it be your home or your stock, stock every day can fluctuate in value dramatically based upon what? What people, generally speaking, that day are thinking about the value of that stock. So today it goes down dramatically, and tomorrow it goes up dramatically, and did their financials change? No. But the belief in the value changed. Cycles magnify that belief to a degree that it affects all assets at value. It affects them at different speeds to different degrees. But in an adverse cycle turn, there's no question that assets that you have that are at expected value, perceived value, will change. And the speed with which they change prospectively because of the interlock and because of the, the availability of information. So you may go to work and everything's fine. And somebody says, did you see what happened today? And you find out that the asset you thought was great is 80% of what it was when you went to work in the morning. And you decide, well, I want to sell a little bit of that asset. So you say, well, sell some of that because I'm concerned that it's going down in value. Well, the very next day, it's only at 60% of the value it was. And now all of a sudden you say, well, maybe I should have sold more because I'm, I've lost 20 more percent today. Change in value, the speed with which value changes, extremely important to the consequence of cycle. Cycles are events that evolve during which value change occurs. In a cycle, it has nothing to do with the real value of the asset. It's the perceived value of the asset. And most important, perception is relevant when sale occurs. If you believe it's worth less and you hold it, well, maybe three months, three days, it'll be worth more. But if you perceive it's worth less and you sell it, it is worth what you sold it for. And that's why cycles are so devastating. Because once you act, you don't get it back. Now, you could sell when it's at 70% of its perceived value and buy it back when it's at 30% of its perceived value. And then you're a big winner. Then you're jumping in before the recovery. The number of people who win in cycles, very few. The number of people who lose in cycles, vast majority. So, so obviously, if the cycle evolves and you hold your house, it doesn't matter. If the cycle evolves and you hold your stock, it doesn't matter. Three years later, you sell your stock for three times the value it was during the cycle, you're a big winner. But unfortunately, large numbers of people react to cycle and large numbers of people, in some cases, can be ruined. I mean, if you've lived in this house for 25 years and, and, and you're retired, let's say, you're not in a position to say, well, I can wait six years when the value comes back. You gotta make payments. You gotta do whatever you need to do to continue to either work or live on retirement. Cycle change changes values to such a magnitude that they can disrupt your ability to make choices. Cycles are extreme. There aren't that many cycles that occur. So over the course of the last 20, 30, 40 years, there haven't been that many cycles. But when they occur, massive value depletion occurs. When they occur, there's no escaping the fact that if you make the wrong decision at the wrong moment in time, you could lose massive amounts of money. You could be a very sound investor over a long period of time, whether it's the house you're living in, which is worth four times 
what it was worth the day you bought it. Or the stock that you're holding, which at one time was worth 10 times the value it was the day you bought it. If you hold through the cycle, if you have the ability to hold through the cycle, then you have the absolute certainty that nothing has changed in the value of that asset until the next positive cycle occurs. Having the ability to hold is important. Because if you don't have the ability to hold, you're subject to whatever the momentary value may be. From one moment to the next, if you have to sell, if the demands upon you necessitate that you sell, and it's the wrong time, you lose massive amounts of money. So, if I haven't depressed you all, <laughs> um, I'd, I'd be glad to take questions if anyone would like to. Yes, sir. But it seems to me that we, as a species, have generally learned over the last 70,000 70, years. And so we've had the trust issue as the foundational thing with respect to money and everything else for that period of time. But we've learned a lot of different games and tricks to deal with it to accommodate the increased risks and the increased knowledge of risks based on interlocking risks, as you put it. And the question is, uh, is it not the case that given the increases in Bank of Basel III, um, reserves that are maintained under the models that many of the large financial players have also had increased the too big to fail group of increased uh, liquid assets, that the actual risks and the no nature of the cycle has essentially disappeared from the system because we have the tools in place to avoid that if there seems to be an incipient uh, situation? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> <laughs> the, the unfortunate reality is that, that we've designed, since the last cycle, a means by which banks, in particular, were forced by their regulators to run models to project how much money they would lose and to create large pools of capital. Capital costs money. Capital makes the company less efficient, less effective. The company doesn't have the money it needs to spend on whatever the business is that the company is doing because it's accumulating capital for loss. So, as has been the case in the recent past, FASB has decided to put in place Cecil. Who's FASB? Who's Cecil? The imbeciles have decided that we will accelerate loss. We will design a new accounting method that will accelerate loss. Exactly what the regulators were trying to accomplish, have enough capital to accommodate loss. Cecil accounting. The brilliant people of today have decided that they're smarter than all the accounts that existed before and we're going to accelerate the speed with which loss will be recognized. Accelerate loss to the point the day you write the loan, you write off a share of the loan. We are among the, the best run banks in the country. We lose less money than everybody loses. It is a proven fact that in cycle turn, we've actually lent more money. Other banks like Bowery, American, Great, went out of business. Yet Cecil does not take into account anything with regard to the quality of the lending. It just says, recognize a loss the day you do the loan. Recognize the loss. For example, we have very few assets that lose money. They don't care. This is FASB, protected by the law. FASB, that's not KPMG. That's not any accounting firm. That's FASB. They have no money. They have the accountants from the accounting firms who work for them. They write the, the rules, and then they go back to the accounting firm. So legally, who are you going to go after? It's the FASB. Who the hell is the FASB? The bottom line, all of this extra capital evaporates 
under rules that accelerate losses to the day you write the loan, you write off a share of the loan, on the assumption that broad brush, you're going to lose money on the loan. Well, we don't. Many, 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 many companies don't lose money on every single loan they write. But under this brilliant new idea, which is now being pushed back on, banks across the country, organizations across the country, are in fact trying to stop Cecil. How many of you in your day-to-day -day activity have heard of Cecil? Well, <laughs> this, this imbecilic decision has meaningful effect on capital. So banks are spending large amounts of money building capital, and Cecil, by accounting rule, will evaporate capital. Not based upon fact, based upon assumption. Based upon every loan that you do should have a certain share of that loan written off, and the speed with which you write off loans should be accelerated. So, as we approach the possibility of cycle turn, we have new accounting rules that will accelerate the speed with which we lose money. So I, I think the unfortunate reality is that the people that are in, in decision-making positions do not always make the right decisions. And when they make decisions that are impactful to large numbers, they have consequences. Cecil, by example, is all assets that are generated by banks. All lending is, is supposed to, under the rules, have a write-off the day you make the loan. And then the speed with which you write off the asset is accelerated over the course of the time that that loan is in your portfolio. So whatever the historical facts may be are ignored because we have new accounting rules. So, and that's only one example. The, the unfortunate reality is that the likelihood that adverse value change is prospective is truly there. The, the speed with which it changes will be dependent upon events. Some of those events will have some measure of control. Some of those events will literally spiral out of control. As adverse events become more and more evident, they will create more adverse events. So we're not talking just about a house on the corner. We're talking about the value of all assets because in cycle turn, cycle turn is a belief, which means people make the decision based upon what they believe. Doesn't mean they're right. Doesn't mean that the value that they perceive they need to sell at is right. It merely means that as a consequence of the moment in time, as a consequence of personal belief, whether you're a broker or your grandma, you've decided that you want to sell an asset that you have control over. When enough people are selling at discounted value, values go down. So, yes, sir. To what extent are loans based on the value of the collateral? Um, and uh, to what extent uh, is there recourse beyond that? And how does that compare today to uh, the situation in 2008? Well, 2008 values were different than they are today. Um, it doesn't mean that, that the proportionate change might be exactly the same today as it was in 2008. So values, in fact, go up and they go down based upon lots of, of reasons. Availability of the product. So, so for example, if you have a lot of people that want to particularly live in a particular community, let's just say in Manhattan, and there are only a few buildings, and, and let's just say there are 10,000 units in that community, the value of those 10,000 units can go up until the number of people that are available to live in those 10,000 units goes down. So, for some reason, jobs in that community are not necessarily as prevalent. Or, the owner of the building isn't capable of making the necessary repairs to the building. 
doesn't provide heat or otherwise. There's a change in the viability of the living space. This is just with regard to that type asset. There are many, many, many different types of assets. Um, student loans, different, different asset, right? Our young people today are burdened by massive student loans. How dare we create an environment where a young person has to spend a fortune to get an education, and then that loan has to be repaid over the early period in their life. What a shame that we've been so incompetent as the parents of the world, United States, in creating an environment where we let universities charge massive amounts of money to young people who are smart, who are working hard, have every intention of doing the right thing, but have to repay massive loans to get an education. Well, there were always loans to get an education. Never to the degree that young people are burdened today. Young people are getting married later for a whole lot of reasons. Young people are buying houses later explicitly because they're trying to deal with their student loan debt. They want to do the right thing. They want to pay off their loans. We created the environment wherein these loans are massive. Most people who are educated to be one thing become something else. If they get a good enough job, they'll be able to pay off their loan and maybe at some later date actually buy a house. But you can't deny the loan. Those loans are all there. The kids didn't create the environment. The parents allowed the environment. You got to go to this school. You got to get a degree from this school. And by the way, I'll help you get a loan. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, there are many things prospectively that um, lend themselves to an outcome other than the intent. And, and there's no escaping the fact that, that not everything is bad. In many ways, we're in a very good place. The U.S. economy is doing better than it's done in an extraordinarily long period of time for some good reasons. But the risks to the U.S. economy are, in fact, incredibly bad because of extraordinary bad politics. The desire to not do what's in the best interest of everybody, but to do what is in the best political interest has become pretty apparent. Well, there are consequences of things like that. There are financial consequences of things like that. The idea that, that people that represent us would go out of their way to hurt us makes no sense. But if they're doing what they do and they get a pass by the media, which, which when I was young it was inconceivable. Walter Cronkite was as close to God as you could be. You know, he only told the truth. That's not the case today. It's overwhelmingly obvious it's not the case today. But massive numbers of people accept this. There are consequences of being willing to be lied to. There are consequences of being willing to let your children take on massive debt. Oh yeah, there are some parents that pay off the debt of their kids. But not enough. There are way too many kids that have massive debt. They don't even have the job they thought they were going to get. They're not making the money they thought they were going to make. But they have this debt. What did they learn? They overpaid for what they got. You know, the, the unfortunate reality is that, that that's not going to cause the cycle turn. But a cycle turn is a composite of all those things all those things that have value, having the potential of changing in value, and the change in value of some of the bigger things automatically changes the value of a lot of the little things. Because, because consequence of adverse change can multiply itself. And therefore, you can believe, well, I've got this problem under control until the next problem or 
worse, the problem you have under control has changed. The value of your asset, time. Yes. So, you only have to deal with this for a couple more minutes. <laughs> uh, the, yes, sir. Oh, ma'am. I'm sorry. <laughs> I saw your hand. I didn't see your face. <laughs> insightful uh, discussion. Thank you very much for all the insight. Thank you. And I totally agree about what you say about the student loan because student loan is worse than mortgage because we can foreclose our houses, but we cannot default our student loan. And also, I think like for many high school students, the parents told them, hey, you cannot buy a new car for a two, uh, 18 years old student. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, they let the student to take out massive student loan. Yes that can buy them few new cars. Yes, yes. So to me, it's very ironic. And I'm, in, I'm having a lot of student loan also and trying to pay it off. And you know, I, I think it's, it's really important that a frank conversation occurs because large numbers of parents who absolutely believe they're doing the right thing for yes, their, their children yes. allow their children to take on these massive student loans. They wouldn't let their child go out and buy a car and take a loan. But going to school, you can take a massive loan. Yes. By the time you finish college, a student can have a loan four times the size of the parent's first loan on their house. Totally agree. You know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. But people don't necessarily put things in the proper perspective. There are consequences of taking out big loans. And certainly a student loan is a loan. Yes, sir. I, I would say, and, and, and this is the unfortunate tragedy, it could be any series of negative events that convinces enough people to act on those assets that they have control over. Any sequence of negative events, that's a lot of things. That could happen next week. That could happen in three months. The excess values are already in place. There are some values that have already begun to adjust, but there's still excess values. So for example, real estate in the New York market has already begun to adjust down. That's not cycle turn. That is normal consequence of excess value. Cycle turn is far more material, and when it begins, it happens very rapidly. So, so it, is, it is not as though one can pick a date or one can pick an event. It's the cumulative belief of growing numbers of people that the value of the assets they control, the value of the assets that they control will be less tomorrow than today. And they settle for what they take today. That belief is spontaneous. You pick up the phone, you call your broker, you go to the bank, you do whatever it is that you have control over. People have control of their assets. They don't have to make the right decision. Obviously, if we're going into a really negative cycle and you go and sell your assets sooner rather than later, you win. But, and this is the but, any cycle is not certain. The timing of your action could be precipitous. You could sell your asset too soon. Therefore, you could wind up losing value on your sale. And then while you wait, you may you know, preserve the funds you got from the sale of your assets. While you wait, things may change. You may decide to go back into the market. So. Thank you for a very insightful uh, set of remarks and very sobering. Thank you.